It's my great pleasure to announce the friend of the family, Gaston. I'm coming from the ETH Zurich, so it's a friendly, like a, a friend group. With lots of people actually from there, here also in this team, interestingly. Um, and he will speak about a topic that's also close to our heart, namely, well, two topics at the same time, namely tensor networks and quantum error correction and decoding, bringing it together. And speaking about tensor network decoding beyond two spatial dimensions. So thanks for coming, and the stage is yours. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Already I have many, many interesting discussions. Um, maybe for people who don't know, I'll be here until Thursday. So if you want to go chat with me anytime, I'd be very happy. Um, right. So as I said, there's kind of two aspects to this. There's the tensor networks and there's the decoding part. So I assume there might be people in the audience kind of from what might be uh, interested in one of, of one of the two aspects more specifically. So I'll try to introduce the relevant um, background that you'll need to, to understand it so everyone can get something out of it, even if you're just familiar with one of the two. And so this is some joint work together with uh, Chris Chubb and Joe Rennes, who are also at ETH, or at least Chris Chubb was when he when we did uh, uh, the, uh, the project he actually just, just left recently. Uh, so before we start, let's maybe start with the decoding part of the title and, and, and let's remind ourselves very brief, briefly what the decoding problem is in quantum error correction, right? So in quantum error correction, we want to protect our uh, quantum information from, from noise. So we encode it in a, a redundant in a, in a larger Hilbert space. So typically the, the recovery from noise goes something like this. We have some sort of code word that undergoes a, a noise process. And we prefer some sort of measurements on that noisy syndrome, uh, which shouldn't, hopefully shouldn't uh, affect the quantum information that's stored in it. And this, um, these measurement outcomes should give us clues what sort of errors happen. So we call this the, the syndrome. And we pass that to a classical algorithm, which we call the decoder. And the decoder does some pro processing and then decides on a correction operation that we should apply in our noisy state. And hopefully if the decoder picks the right correction, we end up back to the original state. So today I'm, I'm gonna focus on this classical algorithm, on this decoder, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll also be convinced that using tensor networks to realize this decoder can be interesting, at least in, in some regimes. And very broadly speaking, when we evaluate a, a decoder, a decoding algorithms, we do it according to kind of two criteria. One of them is speed and the other is, is accuracy. So tensor network decoders um, are often very accurate decoders. They sometimes, oh, just go ahead, go ahead. They, they're often a bit more on the slower side, especially these 3D decoders I'm gonna show you today, they're probably too slow to, to be useful for any sort of like real time decoding where you have to do the decoding kind of in a, in a fraction of a second online on, a, on an actual quantum system. But these kind of slow but accurate decoders can still be very interesting for various different reasons. So. First of all, they're interesting just to study codes, right? You might just want to get an idea of how well does a kind of code at least perform in theory. And uh, also quite importantly, um, for near-term quantum error correction experiments, when people don't do any sort of uh, non-Clifford logical gate, so it's arguably just a quantum memory experiment, uh, it turns out that in many cases, you can actually do the decoding fully offline. That means you can do it in post-processing. You don't have to do it in real time which means that uh, you don't actually care about the speed of the decoder that much. So if a, an experimentalist in the near future wants to show some sort of break even with quantum error correction, he's probably more gonna be interested in using the fastest, the, the most accurate decoder that he can find, which runs in reasonable, like runs in on the... What do you mean by studying the code using the decoder? Just um, getting... A, a... Distance estimation or... Yeah, just estimating what sort of logical error rates are achievable, right? For, because for many codes, especially surface level noise, we don't really know what is the optimal threshold and these kinds of things. So just to, um, so that I understand correctly what you said in the second part, with this offline decoding essentially cuts off the correction operation. Like if you don't, like you don't really apply the correction on your physical system, that's kind of the thing what you mean by offline. Right, right. so like you, you have a procedure that just terminates after the measurement. No, the, you want to... the way I would think of it is it's slightly different. I mean, if this correction operation is a Pauli operation, then all the Cliffords that you run are, all the uh, circuits you run are Clifford, 
you can in principle push the poly to the very end, right? It's just a different poly frame, right? Exactly. You're just no, updating the poly frame. No, but I say that what you run on your device is essentially the circuit, but cut off after the syndrome measurement. Um, well, okay, it's a bit more complicated because what you run in practice has multiple syndrome measurements in mm -hmm. sequence, typically. My point is that you don't actually apply an, a physical operation between the syndrome measurement. You just collect the data, and then in post-processing, maybe a day later, you decide what the correction operation would have been at and, the end. And the point you're trying to make here is that, um, I mean, for now, it's fine to do like offline decoding, but for, for an actual version setting, you, you're better faster than the, the nature of generating errors right in real time and that's exactly what speed matters i mean we are, we are all aware of the fact that every quantum experiment will have a supercomputer next door mm. running and um even the supercomputer will have its limits yeah and la latency is a very big problem even if you have a very powerful computer just getting a decoder that can where the end-to-end -end, like syndrome comes in and deci decision comes back has to be really really fast that was actually our motivation for our old like um cell automaton decoder or having just a local rule that you can put on the chip and then you just send bits on chip in the in the device. I think this even made it to a I think a patent with River Lane or so. No. Um, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's inter I feel like there's gonna be a whole second story. I mean, once we actually have some well working decoders, like how do you make this run fast on ASIC? And this is a much more like engineering, like electrical engineering question, right? There might be some decoders you can very well like put onto an FPGA mm -hmm. and some others where you might not be able to do better than what you do on a CPU. And this is, mm -hmm. I mean, this is also gonna be something that's gonna be very important when we actually build these devices. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so let me move on. So since I mentioned Tencent Networks, I don't know, how, uh, if everyone is completely familiar with Sensor Networks, so let me very briefly recap the, the basics, just what we'll need for this. Uh, I won't spend too much time for this. So Tensor Networks, well, they're networks of tensors. And when we speak about tensors in this setting, we're not thinking of tensors in the sense of how physicists sometimes use them in like relativity. We really think of tensors here as kind of multi-dimensional arrays. So uh, for instance, uh, and we denote these tensors with these graphically with these little uh, nodes. And for every index of the tensor, we connect, we, we draw an edge that is connected to that node, right? So if you have a zero dimensional tensor, or just a zero dimensional array, that's a scalar, a one dimensional array or rank, rank one tensor is a vector. So it has like one edge connected to it and you can generalize this to arbitrary uh, rank tensors, arbitrary dimensional arrays. And the only rule you have to know is that you, if you take two tensors and you connect a leg between the, these two tensors, this implies that you perform a, 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 a con contraction. That means that you the, the, the algebraic expression that is represented by that diagram is given by uh, summing over uh, all the possible values of that index that connects the two possible tensors. And then you multiply the, the tensor entries. So really when you ask what is, oh yeah, and we call this number of values that this uh, variable takes, uh, corresponding to a certain leg, we call that the bond dimension of that leg or of that bond. So really when, when I talk about the tensor network in this talk, I'm really just thinking of some graphical representation of some sum of product expression. That's all it is. It's uh, maybe for some people who are more coming from coding theory, you can, if you're familiar with Fourney style factor graphs, the tensor network is just the Fourney style factor graph with the additional rule that kind of internal edges in your factor graph uh, imply that you sum over that that variable. That's that's all it really is. So, um, what? How does a tensor network decoding decoder work in, on a, on a very high level? So the idea is right. The input of our classical algorithm is is the syndrome. Given that syndrome, we generate some sort of tensor network. We contract that tensor network. That means this algebraic expression that it represents. We try to actually numerically evaluate it on the computer. And then using that contraction result, we, we decide on, on, on the correction that we apply. And really step one and step three here are, at least from a computational point of view, they're kind of trivial. And the real, real meat of the decoder lies in that contraction. And in fact, uh, the tensor network decoder is usually set up in a way that if you do this contraction exactly without any sort of numerical approximation, you would obtain the optimal decoder, which means it's the decoder which outputs the right correction with the highest physical physically possible probability. Can I ask a question? Yes. 
Um, I mean, not to ask too many questions. Sorry about that. This uh, yeah, uh, well, um, well uh, presumably you will say this in the next slide or so something that it's kind of a hard. It's it's a hard problem to contract exactly right. It's sharply hard. Um, in two spatial dimensions, or for any graph that has loops for that matter. Um, and this the, the, the question is much to what extent is this an issue? And um, to put this into context, you might know that um, well, in, in condensed matter, people are using tensor networks all over the place, and there people use approximate contraction schemes. Obviously, in this in this many variants of corner transfer matrices and so on to do when there's so many variants of approximate maps contraction. Um, but also what is true is that the, the hardness of contraction goes away for important families of problems, namely for PEPs that have uniformly gap parents, you can contract in quasi polynomial time. It's kind of a bit ironic because these are the problems most condensed matter people are interested in anyway. So the problems people actually contract in actual reality are actually not the hard instances. It's mm -hmm. kind of cute that there is kind of fine. But now comes my question. Um, in your tensor network decoding, yes, again, apparent, at least a fictitious one, it's not the real Hamiltonian, but it's, it's some Hamiltonian. Is this gapped? And do, do these results of like quasi polynomial decode uh, contraction hold for your setting? Or are you facing the full might of sharply hard hardness of contraction? Oh, this is a big question. No, it's it's a it's an excellent question. It's a very good question. So, um, so maybe I'll first say what we observe numerically. Numerically, we observe at least in the two D case, it seems that we are dealing with easy instances all oh. the way. Everything you just th throw this decoder at pretty much any two D code you you can find. You take some random triangulation, whatever, it just works. Uh, there's no proof why. Uh, maybe also because it's a bit harder to understand what the intermediate states in the truncation in, in the contraction really mean. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you could prove it. You might have to do it kind of on a code by code basis, which is very very tricky. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of any results that would actually prove that it's an e easy instance. I see. Interesting. I mean, even our result is a, is a little bit preliminary to say that it covers the full the full contraction. And not the intermediate steps. And you could still argue that there might be something going on in the intermediate steps. We, we don't know anything about this. But interesting. So I suspected this that you don't have the hard instances. That's kind of good to see. Thank yeah, you. no, it's 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 I mean the results are purely numerical. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So does this optimality depend on the underlying noise model in any way? Yes. So the noise model goes into the tensor network as well. Right. But as in it's optimal for all the noise models? No, you... for the specific noise model that you, you put in. So you assume that you know the true yeah. noise model. If you don't know the true noise model, you don't know what the optimal But if you do know the true noise model, you can always construct a tensor network decoder, which is optimal for that noise. That's right. Okay. Yes. I mean, the decoding problem as is, is phrased with respect to a noise model. Ah, okay. Because it is about estimating like logical probabilities. Which is like, and they are defined with respect to like how many errors of a certain type do I need? Okay, so it's not like I think theory. No, no, this is in principle works for arbitrary Pauli error. Yeah, but okay, I go, I get back to that later. But there's a caveat: it's Pauli, Pauli noise. Yeah. Okay, so. One, one comment that I also want to make is this tensor network that shows up in this decoder. It follows the locality of the underlying code. So if you give me some sort of 2D local code, a 2D surface code, the tensor network is also going to be 2D local. And if you give me a 3D local code, a 3D surface code, for instance, I will get some sort of 3D local tensor network. And uh, as, as, as we already uh, kind of mentioned before, the, the 2D case has been studied quite a bit before in literature. So I think uh, I mean, tensor network decoding, I think, stems back from what I know from, from a paper from like Tula uh, uh, quite, quite early. But the, the first instance where it was applied to a 2D uh, code was uh, Sergei Spravi paper in 2014, where he used like standard MPS techniques to, to decode the, the, the surface code. And later work, I mean, Chris Chubb, who also gave a talk in this group, uh, a few years ago, generalized this for arbitrary 2D codes, right? And again, what I, what I mentioned before, if you just take kind of standard techniques for 
uh, approximately contracting to the tense network, it will it works amazingly well out of the box, right? So here I, I took a, a table uh, from from Chris's paper, and you see that for various different two D codes or surface codes and color codes for different noise models, the, the threshold that he got with his tense network decoder was essentially the optimal threshold up to numerical uh, accuracy, right? So. 10.917 versus 10.918. So it's, it works amazingly well. Like it, it gives you essentially the optimal decoder in the team. So uh, obviously it's people would want to try to replicate that success story from 2D to 3D, but there's very little work that's been done on that yet. And the reason for that is, is it seems that the approximate contraction of this 3D tensor network is much harder to, to realize in, 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 in practice. And it's much more also much there's also I would argue more and more and more uh, research still in the topic of contracting these three D tensor networks in general. And uh, so you want to ask another stupid question? Yes, Sorry, um, sure, uh, absolutely. You, you, you could also say I'm not answering. Um, I mean, you, you you must know that you know how the um, the effort scales in the bond dimension in two D contraction. It's, it's pretty terrible. What's it's deep above? What is it? Ten? Yeah. Um, uh, is it, it's pretty heavy. Very, very large. Yeah. Um, ben, what is it in three D? I mean, this must work only for a very small one dimension, right? Yes. Um, two is is probably the the absolute upper bound for the bond dimension. Yeah. Oh no no, you can go beyond. We go up to like sixteen ish. What? Oh. I mean, uh, I, I mean we're. We're um, we're kind of sweeping a. I mean, if you have a, a cubic three D tensor network, we're sweeping a peps, kind of uh, across one dimension, right? And the bond dimension of that peps is is sixteen uh, ish, on the largest. Oh. So it's like every every tensor in the peps is like sixteen by sixteen by sixteen by sixteen by by two. You that that works numerically. I mean, it takes some while, but that works numerically. So, but then the, the 3D network has one dimension two. Yes. Okay. Isn't, isn't this what you asked? Uh, maybe, maybe that's a computer. Is it the intermediate state or is it the original 3D tensor network? I, the, I mean the original. Oh, no, no, that has one dimension two. That has okay, one dimension two. Uh, I'm getting pain. I mean, I. I thought it was like an alternate reality. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> and I thought you, you you thought the complexity in the maximum bond dimension no, no, allow in the intermediate state. Thanks for the correction. Okay. <laughs> right. So okay, why should we go to three D first? Of all, we might be interested just at looking at three D codes. And the reason that's maybe even much more important is that when you actually do error correction experiments in practice, uh, the Syndrome extraction circuits themselves uh, are noisy, which means you can't trust the syndromes you get out of your system. So the way how people typically deal with that for these topological codes, they just repeat the syndrome measurement many, many rounds, typically in the order of D, which means that the actual decoding problem you end up having with these sort of realistic uh, noise models is that you actually don't have a 2D, but a 2D plus 1D problem. So the actual tensor network you get from this problem is going to be three-dimensional. So I told you before that uh, we want to use these tensor network decoders, these slow but accurate decoders to for, for kind of near-term quantum memory experiments. But if you want to have them work for these near-term quantum memory experiments, you first have to figure out how to make them work in 3D in the first place. So that's kind of the, the pitch why these 3D tensor network decoders are uh, hopefully promising and, 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 and interesting. So um, this is, okay, this is just kind of the pitch. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I have a few things prepared. We don't, we will see how time goes, uh, we'll, uh, how much of it we'll cover, but I can tell you a little bit about how the optimal decoding problem can be phrased as a tensor network contraction. I can say a little bit about how we do the approximate tensor network contraction of this three-dimensional tensor network. And also maybe more interestingly, how we deal with this circuit level noise, because Dealing with circuit level noise versus a kind of, so to say, regular 3D code, like a 3D surface code is like, the complexity is on a whole other level. It's even much more complicated. Circuit level noise seems to be a completely different story. So let, let me say a little bit about optimal decoding. So I'll, I'll make some assumptions. We're gonna work with a stabilizer code and we're gonna uh, assume that we have Pauli noise, which means that the error that occurs on my state 
is randomly sampled from some distribution of the n qubit uh, polygroup. So the sort of strategy which most decoders directly or indirectly kind of follow is they try to figure out what is the most likely error that occurred uh, on your state given the syndrome information that you observed, right? So if I define this set of poly errors that are kind of compatible with an observed syndrome M, I call that E, what most decoders will do more or less is they essentially try to find the, the element of that of that set E which has the highest probability, right? That's the most likely error and they, they use that for correction. That's actually not the optimal decoder because it doesn't take into account degeneracy. So degeneracy is a property in quantum error correction that you can have physically distinct errors which have identical effect on your code space. So for our purposes here, two Pauli errors which only differ by stabilizer are essentially for all intents and purposes the same error for us. So instead of asking about the most likely error, you should instead ask for the most likely error class. When error class is a set of all the errors which only differ by, by, by a stabilizer. And obviously the probability of a certain error class occurring is given by the, the sum over all the, 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 the probabilities of all the errors that lie in that error class. With that in mind, we're all already quite close to seeing how the tensor network is coming to play. We'll need one additional assumption. We need that our noise model factorizes into terms. So here I've written one way how the noise model can factorize. Um, it, it, uh, this is IID noise, so we have independent noise in every qubit, but we actually don't need to assume this, right? Coming back to the question of before. You just need that your noise model factorizes into a product of local terms. So. Uh, I think the, the more technical condition is that you can write your probability distribution as some sort of random marker field, but yeah, the, the exact details don't matter. It doesn't have to factorize exactly in this way, it just has to factorize. And once you use such a factorization, um, what, what you'll see is that this, this um, uh, probability of the error class, which you had on the previous slide, right? this now becomes some sum of product terms. And as I said previously, the sum of product terms is exactly what uh, the, the the sort of algebraic expression which lend themselves to be represented with a tensor network. So the way how the tensor network decoder works is essentially for every logical error class, we can build one of these tensor networks. We can contract it. This gives us the pro pro uh, probability of that logical error class. And then we just pick the logical error class with the highest probability and use that, an element of the class for the correction. But that means that in each one, you need to contract the full tensor network. You cannot pre-compile. That's right. Um, and it also means that the number of tensor networks you have to consider scales exponentially with the number of logical qubits, yeah, which yeah, a principle is bad. But what you would probably do in practice, if you if you have a code with many logical qubits, you would you would uh, kind of optimally decode every logical qubit separately. Kind of the same thing what people do with the kind of classical LGPC codes, where they kind of um, decode every uh, information bit separately. Like you mean just taking a favorite and naming K different tensor networks instead of looking at all possible exactly the logical exactly yeah that's it. so you have a linear thing and you mentioned like a bit quickly you need the probability to factorize uh, locally but yes. what does it mean locally it means I can write it as a product of uh, factors of expressions where every expression only depends. On 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 a local set of of um, of the elements of the power. By local, you mean small, or by local, you mean small? I mean both. Like it, it, it has to be uh, spatially local, which also implies that it's it's small. Like constant in the system size, but also contained in a geometric ball. Yes, I mean okay. Yeah, the, the, the about this. We don't actually need this assumption. The problem. The, the, the tensor network will also re uh, reflect the locality of your noise uh, model. If your noise model is extremely non-local and you have very like large scale correlations, then what's gonna happen is that your tensor network is also gonna have this uh, long range correlation. You're not gonna have a local tensor network. And you're not happy because it's more difficult to, to contract. contract. Exactly. But in principle, the formalism allows for it, but it's, it's bad for contraction. So this isn't like a fundamental uh limitation or anything like that like you could take a general noise model which had whatever correlations and the difficulty would just be the tensor network representation and contraction that's right okay. but at that point if, if you if, if your noise model is essentially like one big black box 
there's very little point in using tensor networks in the first place. Like the power of the tensor network decoder, I would argue, comes to a certain degree from the factorization of the noise. Yeah. yeah. So um, we, we argue that's kind of two kind of dual ways how you can map the logical error class probability to a tensor network. So we call them the generator and the detector picture. And so here you see both of them drawn for the three by three uh, surface code. And they're kind of, you can, you can argue they're kind of dual to each other. You will notice there's kind of two types of tensors in this tensor network. There's kind of check tensors and delta tensors. We write the little delta tensors with the qualities. And you'll notice that kind of both tensors, uh, tensor networks can be seen as kind of, they're like the same topology, but you just exchange the check and the delta nodes. So that's why you can see these two pictures as being, in some sense, um, dual to each other. But, but okay, but um, so the right hand side is like a, t a tensor network organized way of encoding the parity constraints in the code, right? That's right. Um, and it's I, mean, I see the duality to an extent, but um, there's more information in the left picture than in the right picture, right? Isn't it? No, they both represent the logical error class probability. Yeah, okay. That, I mean, you said this. Oh, I think my question is, why is that? Or, or well, is that so, the, the, I mean, I, I can maybe show from the formula. The, I mean, both of them just use a different kind of sum of products representation of the logical error class probability. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So the, the left one is basically saying you, to, to sum over all the elements of your uh, logical error class, you pick a representative error. And then you multiply it over with all possible stabilizers and you sum over the stabilizers. And that gives you a sum over all the elements in your logical error class. Mm -hmm. Whereas the detector picture is, is in a certain sense a bit dumber. You're summing over all pow possible Paulis. Mm -hmm. And then you're kind of uh, re filtering out all the Paulis you don't want by, by, by these indicator functions where you want to check that your Pauli causes the right syndrome and is in the right logical error class. So these uh, indicator functions are exactly the checks that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And here is some of the Paulis. That means you get uh, a delta tensor on every kind of qubit side, so one for the z and the x component. Here is some of the stabilizers. That means the sum that we have a delta tensor on every kind of stabilizer generator sites in, 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 in our tensor network. What, what exactly are the open legs A and B? That's a very good question. So uh, that has to do with the uh, logical error class. So the how you put the logical error class into the tensor network. So here, the logical error class is kind of hidden in the representative error. You pick a representative error that is in the right logical error class already. Whereas here, um, uh, you you have this kind of parity check that checks that uh, it's in the right logical error class. And that would be a very high weight check in principle because uh, the logical operator is very high weight. And that's a bad thing. So we use an additional trick that's actually going to come in the next slide to uh, remove this uh, high weight check and instead have these open edges. So but you, I mean, just the fact that these Bs are all the same are kind of hiding this. Yes, long range check, but just in your classical variable that you force to be the same. Exactly. That, that's exact. The, the, the problem is you would have some sort of like highway check for the logical, and that's bad for contraction. So what you do is you actually you, you there's like this 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 uh, kind of Hadamard transform identity that you can replace a check node by a delta node if you put a Hadamard in every one of its legs, and then instead of contracting the whole tensor network, we just contract this red uh, circle around it here. And then if you if you fix the value of the logical operator here, you can kind of um, uh, try, like uh, put it onto every individual local side. So you kind of dissolve the highway check into into local things. The disadvantage is this means that you need to to like in, in principle, if if you if you had an open edge like this, you could imagine that you contract this tensor network and keep the open edge during the contraction. So you would only need to contract one single time. Because of this dissolving trick that we're using, you actually have to contract it for every possible value of the logical operator. That's a drawback that you get, but the advantage is that you don't you get rid of this highway check. Yeah. So the AVs in your previous figure just label the, like they each are zero or one, so four possibilities, they label the four distinct logical Pauli classes. Precisely. Right? Logical like this. Okay. That's, that's exactly what it is, yes. yes.
Um, I can maybe say a little bit about approximate tensor network contraction. So I have some animations here for that. Uh, so this might be That's Chris Chop's style, right? Yes. <laughs> so half of the animation I stole from, from Chris Chop's presentation and some of them I, I uh, added on top of it. So I, I, I assume you've probably all seen this in one form or another already. You've already seen Chris Chop's talk, so I'll go over it very quickly. Uh, if you have a very nice kind of 2D tensor network, uh, let's assume for simplicity we have a square tensor network, which is maybe what, not what you have in practice for, for, for uh, error correction, but there's kind of ways that there's a sweep line algorithm where you can kind of generalize this idea to arbitrary planar tensor networks. The idea is you want to kind of sweep a line from the left to the right and, and, and contract all the tensors on the way that you uh, that you get. So essentially, or put differently, you want to contract one column after another into the leftmost column, right? So if you if you start kind of with the first two columns together, you 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 contract the second column, the first column, the effect is that the bond dimension on this first column is gonna grow. And if you repeat the process many times, what's gonna happen is the size of these tensors is gonna grow exponentially. So you have to truncate these bonds to actually uh, get a metric that works numerically in practice. So that's where the numerical approximation comes into play. Ooh, a nice animation. Yeah, it's really I cool. I want to steal it too. <laughs> sure, I mean, the, the animation is, um, I think Chris has it on his personal website, so you can just like open the browser yeah, and play from there. Yes, but it's very nice. <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea, you just repeat this, you contract a column, truncate, contract that column, truncate, and you end up with a nice kind of 1D tensor network, which you can contract exactly efficiently. So you might think, okay, let's try to play the same game in 3D, right? Let's say we have some kind of three-dimensional tensor network. Let's say also it's, it's kind of cubic for, for simplicity. So instead of sweeping a line from left to right, we're not gonna sweep a line, uh, a plane from bottom to top. So we're gonna contract contract kind of one layer at a time into the bottommost layer. The effect is again, the bond dimension is gonna increase here on the uh, bottommost layer. So you have to truncate that, and then you can repeat this game until uh, you end up with a 2D tensor network where you can use the same techniques we had previously. Now, this is not exactly what we do in practice. We don't, don't actually, in our code, we ended up not contracting like one layer at a time. We kind of always ex extruded two neighboring tensors from the layer contracted these two tensors in a specific way, then did the truncation. So we kind of split up the layer into a sequence of two qubit gates, but then animation still gives you kind of the, the, the gist of what's going on. Right. So this, so in, in this animation, you would think that the 2D and the 3D case uh, kind of look pretty similar. So why, why should the 3D case be so much harder than the 2D case? It all has to do with the truncation of the intermediate state, right? So when you have, uh, when you truncate this 2D tensor network, your intermediate state is going to be this, this 1D line of tensors or an MPS. And when you want to truncate the bond of an MPS, there's a very well, it's very well known how to do that. It's pretty easy because you can think of this bond kind of separating your, your, your system into two disjoint sets. And then the standard tensor network stuff. But if you try to play the same game with your peps, that will actually not work. Because if you cut your peps at one of your bonds that you want to truncate, it doesn't actually separate your peps into two disjoint, disjoint systems. Which means that um, figuring out how to do the, the best possible truncation in this peps networks is much harder. Or put differently, the, the kind of correlations between two sides could be mediated also in, in, in many, many different uh, ways, right? There's not just one path which can kind of mediate correlations between two sides. So what we ended up using in practice is something that's called the simple update method. So I'm sure like um, tensometric people will be very familiar with that. That's kind of a, a technique um, that uh, the, the idea of the technique is to store on every bond of your peps, you're gonna store a, a diagonal uh, matrix. And the goal of that diagonal matrix is that it plays this, it, 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 it plays the role of approximating uh, doing a rank one approximation of the environment for every single side on your pep. So for every peps, looking at the uh, neighboring bonds, uh, these uh, 
diagonal uh, matrices will um, approximate the environment, which allows you to do a truncation, which is at least a little bit more mot motivated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very emotional thing for many people. Yes. The, things, uh, the simple update. If you go to 10 dog meetings, you get very heated reactions. Like, I mean, some people, I mean, in some settings of the time evolution, there's no other way to do it. I mean, you have to do it. You gotta stay with them, but some people say, oh, you get random numbers, you do simple updates. Uh, be be prepared that people have strong yeah. opinions of these simple. Yes, and I'm very, actually, this is like one of the, I'm very interested to speak about the, the tensor network experts here exactly for this, because I mean, we're not tensor network people from as a background. So we, we tried a couple of different things. We, we tried other gauging methods besides the simple update. We tried some BP-based gauging methods, which didn't work too well for us, surprisingly. The BP converged very slowly. Uh, we tried a couple of different things. Um, the other problem is since we're doing decoding, right, we have to try, uh, do this contraction many, many, many times. So we don't necessarily want the most accurate technique. We also want something that runs pretty quickly and the SU is pretty cheap in that regard. Um, so that's what at the end we settled using the simple update method. But uh, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to, to talk uh, with, with people here about if you have like any ideas, like why this is like a very stupid idea or why you should do it differently. Like this is the kind of feedback that I'm hoping for. So I, I can give you some numerical results uh, that we, we got out of this. Uh, so first we, we tried this on the 3D surface code and we tried it for different noise model for bit flip noise, phase flip noise and depolarizing noise. So first of all, um, for those who might not know that for the 3D surface code, it's not like the 2D surface code where you have a symmetry between X and Z stabilizers. Actually, one of the two uh, kind of stabilizers is weight six and the other is weight four. So people sometimes call that the point sector and the loop sector. Uh, so here the bit flip noise is the weight six. Uh, point sector case, and that's the one that's arguably easier to decode because you can use matching in that setting. And you can see that, uh, so we, we compare our tensor network decoder with matching. So matching realizes the min weight decoder here. That means the kind of optimal decoder without degeneracy, so to say. And you can see that the tensor network here uh, gets better result than the matching decoder, which is pretty cool. But unfortunately, we don't quite get optimal uh, results. So the optimal threshold is known to be around 3.3%. So our result seems to be somewhere between like the mean weights decoder and the optimal decoder. So we're, we don't seem to replicate the same kind of success that you have in 2D. Um, we don't get optimal thresholds, but we still get something that seems to beat the state of the art. So similarly for, for the loop sector and the depolarizing case, we compared to what at least we believe is the state of the art from what we could tell, which was BPOSD in both cases. And in both cases, we were able to beat uh, BPOSD quite handily. So here in the phase slip noise case in the loop sector, the optimal threshold is around 23%. So it seems that the crossing point we get is somewhat closer to that, which is quite good. But you also notice that at like higher distances, it, it starts behaving kind of a little bit weird. You probably would have needed a, a larger bond dimension here. So can you um, shortly explain the plots a bit more? So I mean, the Ds you uh, indicated, but uh, still, could you explain this shortly? And then you mentioned the bond dimension. So all these plots are for a fixed truncation. That's right. There's always so a fixed you bond would dimension. Expect, like in the limit of infinite bond dimension, this should have be just the optimal decoder, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so it should, like, if you increase the bond dimension, this, all, all these plots should move to the right. Th that's true. You should always take this. There's like no one the tensor network decoder. It's always depending on the, the this approximation uh, to the truncation. So this is with uh, decoding times in the order of a few seconds. So we could have gone higher. This is what we could stomach from, from a <laughs> kind of how much computational power we had available. Um, right, so you wanted to me to explain the graph, right? So uh, the, the dashed line is, is, is the reference. So that's the matching and that's the tensor network decoder. And we just draw the logical versus physical error rate for different, uh, different distances, as you say. So from distance three to distance 11 which is, I mean, distance 11 is not too great. I think it corresponds to distance 35-ish in 2D if you count the, compare the number of qubits, something like that. 
Um, so it's not too great, but and, and beyond that, it just starts getting so slow that uh, we didn't really bother simulating it too much. Yeah. So the distances of uh, one of the two error types in the three D surface cores is much higher than the other one, right? For the in the like a logical error that is caused by a point sector errors. Um, has a way lower distance than the logical error. Uh, yes, the so right. uh, so the D's are they the same? Sorry, both? like I would right. expect a distance eleven. It's, it's the size of your three D lattice. If you okay, take the three D so. lattice, it is an eleven by eleven by eleven three D lattice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. actually, you know, right. I, I should have put it like that. That's so from the phase flip noise, the distance would actually be eleven squared or something. Um, yeah. that might be yes, yes. I think that's true. Thanks. So right. You mentioned internet dark decoding here doesn't achieve the optimal performance. That's just because the contraction is not uh, exact. Yes. So it would, right? Because it would if you. It should in the principle, right? Yes. In, 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 yeah. So what we also observe is with the SU, we start getting some. Uh, numerical accuracy issues where you, because you have like inverses in the SU that show up and then we have very small numbers and we have, um, yeah. There's numerical issues in principle with the SU. So I'm, I, I don't want to say with the SU, you, you, you can, it will work. But in principle, if you if you just, the I mean, if you do like the naive tensor network contraction, you just choose a large enough bond dimension, it will converge, yes. What's the largest D so that a lookup table would still fit on Earth? And don't need look um, exoplanets to um, store your. No, I'm not really three specific. works. I'm looking, but I mean, um, no, 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 no. That's the, a good question. The, 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 I mean, it, it's super nice, but I mean, I'm, really, I'm, I'm pretty sure in three D it's three. Sorry, it's three by D equals three. Okay, in three D. Oh, very good. Uh, yeah. Maybe but I know I know for circuit level noise. So I'm I haven't tried the lookup table on, on on these problems. I know for the circuit level noise, D equals five is like way beyond. Do you need like? Number, I mean, thousands of thousands of thousands of, of terabytes of memory to store the lookup table. Uh, I would assume that probably it's the same here, like maybe five if it's at the most, but certainly not seven. Where would the optimal curves be? We don't know. Okay. So the thing is, the way how you get the optimal thresholds is you there's like some way to map this problem to like statistical mechanical problems. And then there's like some reasoning that you're gonna have there, there has to be a phase transition that statistical mechanical problem at the same point where you have the threshold. But that's so the, but you just detect where that phase transition is. That it doesn't tell you how well the decoder, optimal decoder should be. So the, the answer is we, we don't know. I yeah. think it was the same point. No? No, the threshold is the same point. But you can't know what these curves will look like, right? Ah, you mean the error rate? The error rate, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. But even in the 3D case, the mappings that you showed, evaluating the tensor network is like analytically is just equivalent as calculating the partition sum of this classical statmec model, right? Yes. Yes. So then if you carry out everything, it should be the optimal. Yes. But then for the like for small sizes you could find out. Yeah, so the three and five are I'm pretty sure they're optimal, yeah. So I, it's hard to say at, at which point we start deviating yeah. from the optimal, which also means by the way that since three and five are pretty good, it means also the threshold must shift to the right quite a bit. So maybe also another reason why we don't get the optimal threshold is because we can't go to high enough distances and we observe finite size effects. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Fair enough. Can maybe say before we end a little bit about circuit level noise because that's also a very interesting topic. So I, I told you all earlier, right? When when you have noise in your syndrome extraction circuits, um, everything gets much more complicated. First of all, just de like mathematically describing the optimal uh, decoding problem gets much much easier, uh, much much more more difficult, right? Because you have to keep track of all possible faults that can happen in space time of your circuit. You have to keep track how these faults can can like spread through your circuits and so on. And um, so there's there's a couple of different ways how you can formalize that. So we ended up using uh, something that's called a, a detector error model, or some people also call it the decoding hypergraph, from what I can tell. 
it's just exactly the same thing. And essentially, these formalisms allow you to reduce the problem of, of, of uh, uh, decoding the circuit level noise to, to a classical uh, problem of decoding a classical linear code. I, I maybe won't go too much into detail on how that works for, for time reasons, but the, the gist of it is these frameworks allow us to uh, apply this tensor network decoder. Uh, but unfortunately, even if you take like a very simple code, if you take like a five by five uh, rotated surface code with kind of five repetitions, you get uh, kind of a Lovecraftian horror looking like thing like this, which is uh, very sad. So this might look like it's completely random. It actually has structure. It is pretty local. You might actually notice there's kind of different layers in the tensor network. That's because this corresponds to the different measurement rounds uh, you have in your circuit. So um, very structured, it is local, but it's just so large that it's impossible to see in this picture. So uh, most kind of methods for contracting such like, 3D tense networks will not work with something so irregular like this. So we had to come up with some additional tricks to make it work. So what we ended up doing, we did uh, some, some what you say call pre-compression of that tensor network. So we took that tensor network and tried to compress it into a simpler cubic lattice form. So the idea is that we took kind of all the tensors, which turn out to be weighted delta tensors, uh, luckily, uh, which do not lie on, on, on that kind of cubic lattice. And we kind of snaked them to enforce them to, to, be, to, to kind of follow that cubic lattice structure. So we added some additional kind of ghost delta nodes and then included those into the indiv individual lattice sites. Which is good that it means we, we get from a very unstructured tensor network to a very structured tensor network. The cost that we pay is, again, the bond dimension uh, in that cubic tensor network is going to explode. So here again, uh, we use the simple update technique to uh, truncate these bonds in that cubic tensor network so it could uh, get to a manageable size. And um, and one, one point is why this pre-compression was very expensive, especially because you need a simple update on the kind of 3D system. Um, one trick that we had is we kept an open edge on every one of the sides of that uh, cubic tensor network. It's not actually drawn in the picture, but we had an open edge corresponding to the cinder measurement outcome, which means that this pre-compression that we did, we only need to do it once offline. And that for every sample that we uh, decode, we, we contract the cinder value onto the local sites and we can reuse the pre-compressed tensor network. So it's a very expensive step. We made it run overnight. It took like a few hours, but then you can reuse it for every sample. So actually you can amortize the cost of that pre-compression quite a bit. And that's really the only way how we managed to actually get the tensor network decoder running in, for circuit level noise. So, um, yes, so while we managed to get it running, we couldn't go to as, high distances as before, we only managed to go out to distance seven, just because, I mean, already in the distance five, we imagine like there was a huge thing, the distance seven is like even worse. Uh, and we have to take like hundreds of thousands of samples uh, to, to get like a, a, a threshold curve, right? So we only managed to get out up to distance seven, but still we were quite happy that we've managed to get the 3D tensor network decoder running for circuit level noise. And we were able to, to be beat, uh, matching at least quite convincingly on, on that circuit level noise. Yeah. Okay, so that's, with that, I'm already at the summary. So um, I showed you in this talk how optimal decoding can be expressed as a tensor network contraction. So there was this generator picture and the detector picture. So maybe, I'm not sure I've said that before. Those of you are familiar with the step -mac mapping by like Steve Flamia and Chris Chubb. Mathematically, that corresponds to the generator picture. So it's it's the same thing I showed there that what they also did previously. It's just that I showed it without kind of the step neck language associated with it. And the detector picture um, is, is, is really something different. And we actually noticed in practice that uh, in some instances, the detector picture seemed to work better for approximate contraction, interestingly. So when you decode 2D codes, kind of the standard contraction techniques you, you, you have for, for uh, 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 contracting these tensor networks work out of the box, and it's really a, a big success story. Whereas for three D codes, it's it's much harder to make these decoders work well, and we don't get the optimal thresholds. We beat the state of the art, but we don't get optimal thresholds. And uh, now two D plus circuit level noise that's like even harder because we don't only have a three D tensor network; we have a three D tensor network with an insanely complicated structure. 
So uh, just like some thoughts that uh, we have on this. So again, as I said, we, we run into quite severe speed and accuracy issues. And um, we, we tried a couple of different things to realize this 3D tensor network contraction. So, um, but obviously we, we couldn't like exhaustively try out all the techniques that are out there. So if, if people here have like any ideas, what sort of tricks or techniques they think that, that would work or just interested in more details, how exactly we, 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 we did this in practice, I'd be very, very interested to talk with the tensor network people about this. Uh, so to a certain degree, we do consider our result as a, as a bit as a proof of principle because probably like more more experienced people uh, have a shot at this. They could probably uh, get a better like speed and accuracy out of the contraction. Um, and hopefully, I mean, the kind of goal that we're we're straining for, right, is at some point if if we can get these decoders to be accurate enough, is they'll they'll allow us to 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 kind of probe the importance of degeneracy. Uh, to a much larger extent than we're able nowadays, right? So uh, there's a little bit that is understood. That's even in 2D, there's not that much that is understood about the importance of degeneracy, I would argue. In 3D, even less so. And from what I can tell in 3D, like circuit level noise, it's completely open. Like no one has an idea like how important degeneracy really is in that setting. So hopefully 3D tensor network decoders could give us some answers in that direction. <laughs> And also the other point I mentioned in the introduction is, I mean, it's still interesting for experimentalists to have some sort of toolbox with very accurate decoders. So maybe for their kind of memory experiments, they 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 could maybe use these tensor network decoders. Yeah, that's what I think. Thanks for the wonderful talk. That was really good. Thanks. Philip.